this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. The countdown has begun. Find out only on Safety FM. This episode of the broadcast and the podcast is brought to you by Arrow. The next generation error reduction and mitigation system. For more information, go to aerohp.com. Well, hello and welcome to Safety FM. This is Jay Allen. Hopefully you're having a great time so far this week. Holiday season's already into full effect. The end of the year's right around the corner. Matter of fact, even the end of the decade is coming right upon us. So as you might have seen so far, we actually do have a countdown going on at our lovely little website, safetyfm.com, of something that's coming up here in the next, well, we'll say a few days or so, if you take a look at the cloud, on the actual website. But before we get into today's interview and going into more discussion of what the countdown's about, I wanted to give everybody a reminder, if they don't know already, about a new show that's coming on to Safety FM. And that's called The Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast with Rob Fisher. Take a listen. Why are we doing an essential leadership podcast? What does it mean? What's it going to be centered around and why should leaders listen to it? To target some of the leadership attributes of human and organizational performance, personality, diversity that will give leaders an opportunity to to listen to in short bursts and then give them something that they can actually do in their organization. Over 25 years helping leaders reducing errors and incidents. Here is your host of the Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast, Rob Fisher. So we're extremely excited to announce that this new show is coming to the network with Rob Fisher. He'll be able to give us insight on how the essential leadership cycle works. We're very excited here at Safety FM of it actually coming about. As for today's interview, I had the great opportunity of interviewing Judy Disney. Judy has been teaching people in manufacturing about human performance for over 12 years. Her skills and experience help her reach people in all levels of organizations from the workers on the shop floor all the way to directors of a business. Judy has a degree in psychology and a master's in business. Judy is retired from Alcoa, where she worked as a frontline supervisor, a department manager, and a plant system manager. After leaving Alcoa, she has traveled around the world teaching people of many countries and cultures how to embrace and be passionate about the science of human performance. Judy Disney is a senior consultant for Fisher Improvement Technologies. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Judy Disney. Oh, yes, from that Disney. Enjoy it here today on Safety FM. Judy, I have to ask a couple of questions. I always like to start asking probably the most obvious question for most people is, how did you start your journey of safety? How did it start for you? So my journey for safety started at Alcoa. I uh, was a frontline supervisor the first 15 years of my career in what we called the ingot plant, where we worked with molten metal. Um, My background before I hired in to be a frontline unit supervisor was I was a supervisor in a bank uh, with a line of tellers. Well, that's a ch- that's a heck of a change for sure. Yes, it was. This was back in the no- early 1980s when uh, Alcoa got told by the federal government that they had to start hiring women because they had government contracts. And uh, so I got I got hired in at that time because I had supervision experience. So how do you find this though? I have to ask that question because I mean that's a that's one job change to another. I mean it's a significant difference in industry. Yeah. So what? How did you discover the Alcoa portion? And I mean, was it were you going because they now had to hire women? Was that the main reason behind it, or how did it come about? 
No, actually, I wasn't even aware of the hot they had to hire women, except that when they did hire me, there were five of us that they hired at that time. <laughs> okay. That was kind of a, an eye-opener. But the, the next eye-opener is I just came from a bank where you worked with 90% women. And now I went to Alcoa, where, where I worked with 99% men. So how do you, how, what do you think of the transition at the time? How does it, how are you looking at, it, especially going from the banking industry to all of a sudden going into Alcoa? So all of a sudden you're going from 90% women doing a totally different industry to all of a sudden, boom, mostly men. And it is a heck of a change for you. Yeah, it was, it was a huge change and I was used to being liked and I went to being instantly not liked because I was considered an outsider not just because I was a woman, but because I had no industrial background whatsoever. So, um, so immediately people saw me as a, a spy. I was there trying to get information for the company because it's, it's a large union facility. I worked at the largest manufacturing plant in, in Iowa, that's where we're located. And, um, it's the largest manufacturing plant in, in the world, quite frankly. And it had about 3,000 employees at the time. And so I was, uh, I was busy just trying to learn. So I quickly learned who I could trust to get honest information from. And it wasn't always from my fellow supervisors. Um, it was oftentimes from people in the union side who were decent human beings and were willing to to help me learn the ropes. Well, and the the interesting part here is that you have a background in education in psychology. So how is this how is this playing a factor to your new role? Well, um, yeah, because I had a degree in psychology, it was interesting to start to recognize how the psychology of the the psych psychology as well as the psychology sociology of what was really going on so for example everyone there were 28 unit supervisors in my department at the time when i hired in and all of them except me had military background and they all had been officers in the military so, so how is that transition going for you at the time then? It, it was all extremely difficult for me, but it, it took me, you know, this was, a, it was a huge learning curve and it took me a long time to figure out, oh my gosh, they're all, they all came from the military. Well, now that explains to me why they're all so command and control kind of people. Um, cause that's how it was. It was very, old school, red, right? right? Yeah, they, <laughs> that's exactly right. They were, they were really drivers and everything had to be their way. So if you can imagine, they didn't always agree on how to do things. They each had their own way and they were always driving there. And of course that isn't my style at all. Um, I'm, we're all people oriented, so I would much rather get to know the people, understand the processes and procedures, and then um, help them follow that. And and then you have supervisors changing, so it made it very difficult to have any kind of consistency. So now, was there a union at Alcoa yes. during this time? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was how it. was that? So how was that adjustment for you as well? Um, that was a really big deal, uh, but I have to give the union credit because I was an outsider. My first six weeks, I was allowed to work with union people as if I was a new union worker. And they let me work side by side with them so that I could learn the day-to-day -day tasks that they were each doing in the different parts of the department. And then so, at the time, being as you're coming in as, were you coming in as a supervisory position already? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, how were they, how are they looking at, it? especially you being a supervisor, and then all of a sudden now you're doing the, you're kind of standing in the same line with the union workers. How are they looking at you? Are they okay with this or how are they modeling what you're doing? Right. So they, they, uh, some of them, you know, it's a, a difference in personality tendencies. Some of them were, were willing to just let me follow them. Some were actually willing to let me just do the work. Um, some of them would let me just jump in and, and drown. 
and then have to come rescue me because some there are some very scary, difficult processes. And um, and then there were those who were really decent human beings who would say, OK, now this is what we're going to go out there and do. I'm going to have you do this, this and this. And if you have any problems at all, just raise your hand and I will stop what we're doing and I'll jump in and I'll help you. So very differences in how people would approach it. So, um, but like I said, some of those people didn't like me at all. And some of them just saw me as a spy, like I was going to be a supervisor and I was learning everything that they're doing. So now I could do something to them nasty later on. So how, I, far, how far along is it before all of a sudden Paul O'Neill stands up and says, we're going to focus mostly on safety as a company. Are we talking years down the road when this is occurring to you and you're going through the whole process before Paul goes out there or what are we talking time for time frame wise well, so it was about six years um, about six years and Paul O'Neill comes in and and now we have a huge focus 100% safety so something that was amazing to me is it became everybody's responsibility to to work safe not just the frontline supervisor like myself to have to try to make sure everybody's working safe and safety became the number one number one priority of our plant and of our business um, is really what Paul O'Neill conquered. And when I made the switch from Alcoa to working to multiple different industries, I've, I've now worked with probably over a hundred safety managers. And when they don't feel empowered to make things happen in their organization, I, I back at the beginning 10 years ago I was in shock because oh. always the safety manager at Alcoa was empowered to do anything and everything they needed done because they were the number one uh, number one thing that had to happen first well I think that a lot of organizations don't empower their safety person and there are there few exceptions out there now mm-hmm. before I get into that portion I have a question where does the love for safety all of a sudden start for you so you started off going from the teller position to going into manufacturing, being a supervisor of manufacturing. So how all of a sudden do you fall in love with the whole safety realm? So probably the number one first time was is when you're part of an event. And I was on the upper level at a melting furnace. And we had a brand new melting furnace that was round. And we were uh, using giant sized buckets to drop scrap metal into a molten bath and uh, the crane operator is above me in a glassed in crane and he went to drop a bucket load into that melting furnace and it exploded and looked like the atom bomb just went off with the whole mushroom cloud of smoke and everything and pieces, large pieces of metal and small ones started flying out of the furnace like bullets. And they were hitting that glass, uh, glassed in cage that he's in just right above my head. And that is when I realized how dangerous things could get in a split moment of time and so from that point on I had a whole new respect and a passion for keeping people safe so you you had seen this in real time as it's occurring is what you're saying then yeah this is in real time and um my panic was oh my gosh my my crane operator is going to be dead and the good news was is he wasn't even injured that's great yeah, he protected himself. He got up and got behind his chair um, and re- virtually was uninjured, scared to death, needless to say. It frightened him to death. He had never experienced anything like that in the 30 years he had been there. So, um, so from that point on, I had a whole new passion for safety. So how does that journey start for you? What do you start doing differently that this is now a focus for you? Well, uh, as a supervisor, probably one of the first things I got involved with was standardizing uh, work, standardizing the processes and procedures, and getting people to work on the same things. What was the best way to do something? And now how do we repeat that across a 24-7 operation? 
And so I got involved in working with people and writing documents to standardize work. So when do you hear about human and organizational performance for the first time? So not till much later in my career. I, uh, I finished 15 years in the ingot plant as a frontline supervisor, and then I switched jobs and I went to the other end. That was the beginning process. I now went to the end process where I worked in the inspect, pack, and ship department uh, for a year or so as a, as a frontline supervisor, then got promoted to being a general supervisor, which now meant all the supervisors in the department reported to me. And then I was re- I was uh, promoted to department manager. Okay. And then in the 90s, as so many facilities did, they did right-sizing, downsizing, whatever you wanted to call it. And uh, I came in to work one day and they had decided to eliminate all the department manager positions and all of the general supervisor positions. And the good news for me was I didn't get walked out that day. I still had a job and my new role was to be over half of the plant where I was going to be over all of all three of the finishing departments. And now I was going to be responsible for lean manufacturing and um, and our safety, our safety systems and our quality systems. Wow. And talk I, about pressure all at one time. Yeah. Yeah. So this was like all brand new to me. I mean, I knew I knew safety and I knew quality because I did a lot of work in inspect, pack and ship with quality and a lot with safety there and as well as in the ingot plant. And now um, I decided I needed to look outside of Alcoa for help. Um, We had lean manufacturing at that point for probably about eight years, um, but it was still relatively um, cumbersome and new. So we didn't have smooth systems yet, but it was was getting better. And so anyway, I went to uh, Tennessee for a five-day class and guess who my teacher was? Rob Fisher, who was teaching human performance. And I sat through that week and every day I got more and more excited about what he was teaching us. And I, I, by the time I left there after a week, I was so anxious. I could hardly wait to get back to my facility and talk to um, the safety director and to the plant manager. And um, so I told them about it and they kind of washed it away in the beginning and I had it took me a year to get the safety director on board and uh, tell them that I really believe we can change the way we do business not only are people going to be safer but we're going to have a better quality product and we are going to be able to be faster and more efficient and we're going to make our customers happier and So, so so how do you decide to go to this class what is the class being featured as that you decide that this is something that you're interested in going to in Nashville? Um, it was about human performance and the fact that it it could improve people's safety and quality and improve businesses. So that's what I was looking for because I was charged with taking waste out of our quality and safety and lean manufacturing systems and so I thought, well, this sounds like a really good thing to go to. That's how it piqued my interest. And that's all I knew was just this little paragraph that I got, you know, from a, from a list of classes that were sponsored outside of Alcoa. So that's, that's how, I, how I went. And I just, I was like, wow, this is really good stuff. And so one year almost to the day, one year after I had been through the class, um, my plant manager approved for us to bring Rob Fisher in for one hour. And in one hour, he spoke to the uh, 12 lead uh, leading um, managers of the plant. And after that one hour, we had them hooked. And Rob agreed to send us to the Iowa nuclear power plant And so we took a bus trip uh, about a month later and we went to the power plant to see what human performance looked like at that facility. And everybody was so impressed that that's that's what did it. We all agreed, this is what we're gonna do. And so we uh, decided to hire Rob's uh, 
Rob Fisher to come in and and teach us about human performance as a leadership group. And after we all went through that training, um, the plant manager said, okay, we are going to do this. And I just want all of us to understand that if human performance fails at our facility, it is going to be because of us. We will have no one else to blame except us. So I, I could only imagine the look of shock that people have on their face at the moment that this is said. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's kind of like going back 15 years and, and having uh, Paul O'Neill tell all of us that safety will now be the number one priority, right? Right. All else will fall second to that. And now here we all are recognizing, hey, we're the leaders. This is it. And I've never forgotten that moment because that moment changed everything for our facility as we went forward because human performance was going to get integrated into what we do because it's a science and we were integrating it already into all of the processes and procedures that we had in place. So now roughly what year are we talking that this is taking place? Um, let's see. That would have been in about 1999, uh, I'm going to guess. Okay. Let's see, 10... No, not either. 2006. 2006. So yeah, how's the initial culture shock? How are people receiving this when they hear this information and all of a sudden this is the first time that they're hearing about human and organizational performance or human performance, however you want to word it. How are they reacting to getting this information? Well, a lot of people, because well, of course, of course, the first thing we do is train all of the managers and supervisor level people. And, and along with that, all the leadership of the union, you never want to forget them. And so we, we taught all leadership on both sides of the table, so to speak, about human performance. And uh, again, the plant manager would always emphasize that it's up to us as leaders to make this successful. So, so basically, there are a lot of naysayers uh, who who thought it was just going to be the flavor of the month and it would come and go like so many other things that they'd seen. And the way they said it was at this point, we've now been using lean manufacturing 10 years. It has never gone away. And this is not going away either because this isn't a program. It's a science that we're integrating into how we do work. So as you look back retrospectively, and we're now in 2019, this is 2006, Mm -hmm. 13 years later, you still hear about this science being referred to as the new view of safety, or this is something that's new. What do you think about that? Especially when people still refer to this as something that's new, but it's been around between, depending who you speak to, between 25 to 27 years. Yeah, well, it's it's like everything <laughs> from the past, I'll say, because I, I now live in a generation where they think all you have to do is turn on your computer and everything travels at the speed of light. But, but the reality is, is what, when you're talking about changing the way people think, act and do things, that doesn't happen at the change of a switch. It, it takes everybody working at it each and every day because because we're humans and this is about changing the way we think and see things and so our natural default is to always go back to the same old ways we've done it so it it constantly takes everybody reminding each other and the system reminding us oh that's right we got to think about human performance we got to think about how we're doing and saying this so as we go back to when you're doing the, the, you're actually involved with the deployment at Alcoa, when they start getting the information, all of a sudden the the leaders are being trained, and now it's kind of it's going down further and further. What are people doing in return? Is it still trying to go back to what the old methods were at the very beginning, or are they looking at it and going, okay, I'm going to adapt to the science, or how is it? I mean, and I know that I'm asking you to to go some time back here, but it, right. I'm just trying to. To see, you know, what is the interaction there, especially at Alcoa, especially after that speech on, you know, if anything, if it fails, it's because us as humans. Yeah. So the, the reality is, is that it takes 
um, each little group at a time, learning and experience it, kind of like me going back to the ingot plant and experiencing an actual explosion to see something dynamic. Well, as you have people doing work, things happen on a daily basis and leadership shows up in a certain way. And what really did it for our organization was leaders showed up differently because automatically when there was a bad outcome, we would blame someone, either the worker, several workers, or maybe even a supervisor. And those people generally always got discipline. They got time off and oftentimes they lost their jobs depending on the severity. And so what we saw happen was that changed. People in leadership showed up and wanted to understand what happened. Not why did you do it? What were you thinking? But rather what occurred? And then we made those individuals part of the remedy of how do we fix this? And so we started to change, not not just the way we showed up and began things, but all the way through the process. And so literally the union leadership would stand and teach classes also to folks, right? It was a it was a mutual team of two two leaders on the union side, two leaders on the on the uh, management side and and when as they would teach union leaders would tell success stories you know hey listen this is what happened down in the ingot plant we had this and this occur and instead of just automatically giving somebody 10 days off or 30 days off we actually sat down with those individuals and tried to see it through their eyes what happened and we started to recognize and identify what really drove things to happen rather than than it being the worker we started to discover it was our systems it didn't matter who we put in the job the same thing would have happened so at this point is this when you start developing the love of wanting to teach this oh yeah well i volunteered Hmm. i volunteered as a manager to to be one of the the uh trainers on the company side so I, I helped teach over 2,000 people over a two-year period. So at what, and, point, at what point do you decide that, okay, I'm going to leave Alcoa and this is something that I want to go do and help out other industries? How do you, how do you come to the determination that this is, this is it for you? So I didn't actually do that. Oh, okay. I, I, I <laughs> it gets better now. Okay. <laughs> I actually didn't decide that. I, I actually um, left Alcoa. And I was um, elated with the progress that we had made because the bottom line is, is about saving people's lives. And I realized at that point, never, ever was I going to know how many errors we had prevented. But what I we could see is how many first aids and total recordable injuries we had prevented because everybody measures that. And in the history of my company, at about 63 years at that point at my facility, we had never, ever gone one month without somebody getting injured. And at after training everyone, we had our first month ever in the history of the company with zero injuries. Now, let me ask about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it becomes one of those things where you had zero injuries or people were looking at it that they didn't want to be the person that was going to report to break the cycle? Your your opinion. Just keep in mind your opinion. opinion. (laughs) So there are, in my opinion, always people out there who um, don't want to report. There, There may be some, but I believe at that point we had gone from from people, the majority of people not ever wanting to report to now we had gone to zero injuries because literally people were thinking, seeing, and doing things differently. And it wasn't because they weren't reporting, because they weren't afraid to report. I can tell you that back, you know, three years before that, people were afraid to report because they were afraid of getting time off, which they couldn't afford or losing their jobs or whatever the penalties were going to be. So people, if they didn't 
have to, they wouldn't report. But now that changed because the union leadership along with the company was saying, we need to know. Because if you report, then we can learn what's break, what the breakdown is in the system and you can help us fix it so that this never happens again to someone else. So, so the whole go, attitude changed. So right then, with everything changing the way that it did, how do you decide, mm-hmm. I'm going to cross this bridge into the, to the training aspect? Because we're, we're there in the journey, but how does, that, how does the bridge form and how do you come across it? I guess is really what it boils down to. You mean in training other people? Right, there? Or decide I'm going to leave Alcoa to go train other people. Oh, so what happens to me then is I, I made the determination to leave Alcoa and I actually wanted to have a less stressful job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's really what it was about. And so I actually went to work for a dentist who was a who was a friend. And then while I was working for the dentist, I got a call from Rob Fisher. And uh, Rob Fisher said, hey, I heard that you, you retired. And uh, I said, yeah, I did. I, and he said, well, uh, I said, yeah, I just want to work part time and I don't want to have a lot of stress. And he said, well, hey, how would you like to come to work teaching human performance for me? And I said, well, I don't know. Let me talk to the dentist. (laughs) And it was like another major change in all honesty. When I left being a supervisor after, you know, 25, 26 years with Alcoa, and now I went to a dental office to be a dental assistant. Oh, my gosh. I mean, the learning curve was huge. And talk about stress. You're putting hands in people's (laughs) mouths, you know. And so um, my dentist said, well, of course, you you should take this opportunity. So the passion that I had was already there. I had already seen what we had accomplished at my facility. And virtually, Rob gave me an offer that I never imagined could happen to me and said, come to work for me. And then since then, I've had the opportunity to work with over you know 25 different companies and help them start their journey to through human performance. Well, I know with Fisher Improvement Technologies, there's been some evolution with some of the technology that is there. And it has went from, we'll say human and organization performance to now what has been developed to advance error reduction in organizations. How do you feel that change has worked out for where you started to where you're at now? It, it's only gotten bigger and better because it's uh, we have added the e-colors to uh, the arrow process, right? And, and, and so and we it, have... And could you explain that to audience members that might not be familiar with what you mean by e-colors? Oh, okay. Um, sure. So uh, we've taken human performance, which is about how people uh, have a lot in common and, and perform, right? And we have tools and, and stuff that makes it possible to have less errors and now e-colors is about personality tendencies and most everybody's been through some type of Myers-Briggs or something where they've learned about yep people have different personality tendencies this was a good class and off they go but when you ask people about it a year or two later they don't remember much about it so kind of like Rob Fisher's human performance the e-colors piece is user-friendly And now we could put those two sciences together and now we're able to help everybody with their personality tendencies and we give them uh, the opportunity to live intentionally by recognizing what their tendencies are and managing those tendencies so that now they can, can use the human performance tools and get the better outcomes that they're looking for. So the first time that you hear this, what is your thought? What do you think of when they say, okay, we're going to tie this e-color thing into it? How does, how do you, how do you look at it? How are you going? How is your reaction? Let's go with that. Uh, Again, um, I have a background. I have a, uh, my degree in psychology. So I was like so excited to see some type of personality tendencies that's actually user-friendly. I can actually remember this and I can use it not just for myself, but my interactions with other people and help them interact with other people. So I was really excited about how this uh, came into to human performance. Something new to have to learn, but it was like, this is, this is great. This is great. So I know that when they do talk about Arrow, that it is also referred to as hop done right 
do you, as you look at it, do you think that that's the, the correct terminology? Um, I do. I, I think that it helps um, make human performance um, eh, done right is, a, is the best term because it allows us the opportunity to not just look at the system and talk about it and try to come up with what we think, but now we're actually able to get to real specifics and have individuals identify and be able to manage their, what their tendencies are that before might have uh, have taken them right into a problem. So where do you think the difficulty lies from people to understand the difference between arrow and standard hop? Because I think that sometimes people go, oh, well, hop is this and arrow sounds similar. Where do you think that people can learn the differential? How do you think that they can go about it to have a good understanding of, okay, there is a difference between the two? Because I get so frustrated with the with like the, the three-day classes where people think, oh, I already know everything about Hop because I took a three-day class. But I think that there's so much information that Arrow fills the gap for. How do you think people can go about to learn the difference? So I, I think that everyone should be taking an arrow class is the best way to start off with. And to ever think that you already know everything about human performance, I can tell you that I've been doing this for over 13 years now, and I still learn and have aha moments, whether it's on the HP piece or whether it's on the e-colors piece, so that now you've brought them together and you see how how they um, are integrated together and how they affect each other on a daily basis, so that now, oh my gosh, I have deeper understanding and greater learnings as a result. Well, Judy, I have to ask so. you, what portion of the journey has happened that you didn't expect to happen so far? I think that the greatest thing for me that has happened is that um, it it was the bringing in of the the e-colors and making arrow so that now um, it's never it's never been about just work for me. It's all about individuals, which is what psychology is about, right? It's about individuals and how they're able to internalize this at a really personal, deep level. And and I actually get the privilege of working with thousands of people who actually internalize this and make a strong decision to live intentionally, to really recognize that sixth sense, those triggers, and they prevent not just themselves, but their family members and their neighbors and their people in their community, as well as those people that they work with on a daily basis. It's like been really incredibly rewarding for me to see how many people make the choice to do that. Well, Judy, I'm going to ask one more question because I know if I don't ask this question, people are going to ask me why I didn't ask this, and it's not related to what we've been talking about. Sure. Your last name, any affiliation (laughs) with the company? You knew it was going to happen. I had to ask. Everybody always (laughs) has. There's always somebody, right? So it's really pretty (laughs) funny. Okay. My last name is Disney. And yes, uh, the first question I always get are, are you related to Walt Disney? And the the answer is yes, I am. However, I married Bob Disney. And Bob Disney, as much as he looks like Walt Disney, is not a direct descendant of Walt. And that is because Walt Disney had two daughters. So there are no children with the last name Disney from Walt Disney. However, Walt's grandfather and my husband's great-grandfather were brothers. And so my husband from those great-grandfathers got the genetics and looks like Walt Disney. Interesting. Very interesting. You knew it was going to come up. I had to ask the question. (laughs) Believe me, my husband, he would be the first to tell you he did not get any of the money (laughs) and he did not get any of the creativity. (laughs) So, Well, Judy, if 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 our listeners want to actually know more about you, where can they find more information? Yes, absolutely. They can reach me on LinkedIn or they can reach me at my email. Well, Judy, I do appreciate you coming on to Safety FM. Oh, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity, Jay. 
The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.